Hello and welcome to today's webinar, The Future of Work is Now, How to Launch Your Remote Workforce with EUC. This event is part of the EUC Masterclass Series. By registering for this event, you should have received an invitation as well, or hopefully you attended the previous event in the series, which was entitled Giant Steps, Baby Steps, Standing Up EUC and Enabling User Access that we want this to be educational. We want to help you to get all of your questions answered around the future of remote work. I know that many of you out there are dealing with remote workforce challenges, and we are here to help. So bring your toughest questions, put them in the questions box there in your audience console, and we'll be doing a Q&A session with our expert presenter. Also, check out in the handouts tab the Nutanix test drive link. It's there that you can click and uh, register to sign up for a free Nutanix test drive that happens in your browser. And finally, on this live event, we'll be awarding a Visa gift card in the amount of $300. So make sure that you stay tuned for that live prize announcement at the end of today's presentation. If you're watching this on demand, I'm sorry, the drawing has already occurred. And now I'm excited to introduce you to today's expert presenter. Uh, Brian has been a presenter for the previous event and uh, will be the presenter for the upcoming event in this series. Brian Sir is a principal technical marketing engineer at Nutanix. I've known Brian for many years. He's got a ton of technical certifications and is a huge expert on this topic. He's written books, uh, many articles, uh, blogs out on the internet, uh, papers, and done many presentations. So we're excited to have Brian back presenting today. And with that, it's time to kick it off. Let's get started. Brian, take it away. Part two of the EUC Masterclass Series, Working From Home Alone keeping the bad guys out and managing your chaos. My name is Brian Sir. I'm a principal technical marketing engineer at Nutanix. Uh, you can read a bit about my blog and uh, the EUC Solutions book that I published. Uh, version 1 is on Amazon and version 2 will be out as a uh, PDF and printed copy uh, from U Nutanix teams uh, that you can find at our trade shows and other places in the future. So just to refresh a little bit um, from part one, um, when we talk about end user computing, there's really kind of two um, genres that this lives in. There's the traditional VDI, um, which can be both uh, virtual desktops and applications, but this is typically hosted on-prem, so it's in your data center and a partner's data center. Um, but these would be, you know, typically solutions from Citrix and VMware Horizon uh, running on top of Nutanix. And then there's the DAS, the desktop as a service, um, you know, service that you would subscribe to. So these are cloud services, and uh, we have uh, Nutanix Xiframe that would fit within this category. And then your desktops and applications uh, certainly could run in a public cloud, uh, but they could also run on-prem on uh, Nutanix clusters using AHV. So the majority of the content that we're covering today uh, really fits into both of these categories. And um, you'll just have a, a little bit variance in your questions based upon whether you're running on-prem or in public cloud, but uh, very similar information. So first, let's talk about centralizing your operations. So as you move to EUC, things just naturally become more centralized. Historically, uh, you know, when you were running PCs and laptops all over the place, you know, things were pretty decentralized. So most organizations had some type of local support at most locations unless they were really small locations say with a few people but generally if you had any decent gathering or significant gathering of users at a location with devices you know that used PCs laptops etc um, they would have some type of local hands and they're there to do uh, you know PC installs application installs swap out broken units handle printer issues you know all those type of uh, endpoint type of questions it'd be hands-on out there um, probably still put in a ticket those tickets would just be handled by the the local staff now some operations even though you were in a disaggregated type of um, architecture with PCs some operations like patching or uh, patching of the OS the applications or packaging of the applications 
uh, are commonly centralized, right? They're probably handled by uh, teams at the you know, corporate office or some you know, main office, and then they're um, patched for the whole company or you know, packaged up the applications that everybody gets to use. So some select things were centralized just because they made sense uh, to do it that way. But the nature of a UC or DAS is to be, to be more centralized, right? Because now your control and management plane is typically a single point. Um, so, you know, Horizon, if you, even if you have it deployed in a few data centers, they can be uh, unified together in what's called a, a cloud pod architecture. So it, it looks like it's a single control plane um, because they've been unified together for global access. Citrix, you know, very similar architecture. And then something like a data service like Xiframe uh, is a single cloud service, even though you can run um, desktops and apps in all kinds of availability zones, on-prem, off-prem, it's still a, a single control and management plane. And then um, typically your infrastructure is centralized, um, maybe in a single site or at least uh, down to a few sites. So um, places that, you know, organizations that don't uh, need multiple sites or don't need disaster recovery or additional high availability could centralize all their desktops and apps into a single site, whether that's a single cloud vendor, uh, you know, a single location in the public cloud or a single data center, um, you know, at a partner uh, or on-prem at one of your facilities. And this would be all the compute, storage, networking infrastructure, uh, all the, you know, typically all the EUC control um, mechanisms also. And then your edge endpoints, um, they basically just become the access points in this case, right? Um, they're most commonly, you know, you'd see thin clients. I see a lot of Chromebooks these days. Um, if you're going to repurpose your PCs, uh, then typically you'd like to build them, you know, kind of rebuild them with either some type of thin OS on it, or if you're still going to use a, a like a Windows OS, then you'd want to severely lock down that PC. So it's really uh, just there for remote access, right? Basically boot up. Uh, hopefully they're doing little to no work on the local PC and it's all done in the remote uh, computing session for that. So there's certainly less work to be done remotely because now those endpoints are just an access point. If they do have some kind of physical uh, you know, breakage, um, then ideally with the EUC architecture, they should be able to just swap out and then they just log back in. There's an EUC client on there or a web browser and then they can connect back up to the remote session. So there's a whole lot less troubleshooting to be done at the edge, uh, a whole lot less handhelding, you know, things for that. So it's just uh, natural for there to be uh, less work uh, done remotely. And then the majority of your patching and all the application work is done, you know, call it in the data center. Um, or at least some centrally, like right? the you know they actually live in the data center, but the teams that do this or team that does that is now probably uh, in a central location, or if you got a few uh, central locations, they're just part of the same team. So much fewer touch points uh, to be done in this. Um, you're just working mostly in the data center, and uh, you know less less areas to to work with. So the operations team, what what's it going to look like, right? If we centralize things. Uh, how is this going to look? So, um, you know, being more centralized leads to probably a single team, but that's not the case uh, in a lot of organizations. So it's kind of three ways I like to talk about this. So status quo means just keep doing the same thing that you do for operations today. So a lot of organizations have a siloed approach, uh, even still today. This means that all the different layers within the data center uh, are typically different teams, right? There's an infrastructure team, and that infrastructure team may just do compute, and then you may have a separate storage team, or the infrastructure team may do compute and storage, and then typically you have a network team. The compute team may or may not be the same as a virtualization team. Sometimes they're separate. Um, I say the broker, but that's the UC broker, right? So um, it's not uncommon to, to see just like a Citrix team or any, you know, call it the, the VDI team. Uh, you generally teams for endpoints, right? They handle all the physical endpoints, the PCs, the laptops, etc. in the field. 
Uh, you've probably got a team that deals with the applications, so like application packaging, upgrades, etc. cetera. Uh, there's always typically a security team hiding around somewhere, a, you know, the guy in the bow tie that shows up in the meetings and asks a lot of tough questions. And, uh, you know, depending upon your organization, your vertically, and there's probably other teams uh, that we haven't listed here. So this works, but some of the challenges, especially when it comes in user computing, is when you have a siloed approach, uh, the time to complete work is extended greatly. Uh, I've worked in a lot of these siloed teams in the past at some very large organizations. And just the kind of nature, like if you have a task that requires you to, say, um, work with the virtualization team, work with an app team, work with the network team, then generally there's a ticket created and the workflow of that ticket is going to flow through each of those teams not all at the same time one by one so the ticket would likely go to say the virtualization team first where they would create you a virtual machine uh, whether they have a template or they install the os and you know they have their time so right so they're maybe going to get a three day or a seven day sla to, to complete that work and generally, human nature, most of those people uh, don't pick up that ticket right when it comes in and complete that work in 15 minutes if it takes that short a time. That ticket may sit there for a day or right to the end of the SLA, and then they'll do their 15 minutes of work and send it to the next person in the queue. So then it goes to the network team, and it's a similar approach, right? They've got a day or three days or seven days to do their work, and they're probably going to use a majority of that time. And then if it goes to the backup team so that backups can get enabled for this new um, you know workflow uh, that happens so you can see the time to complete the work uh, is not automated generally and it, it extends that out and if there's a you know an escalation call where you've got you know like tier one problem um, you generally have to pull in all these teams or the majority of the team and then you're gonna have this big conference call uh, you're going to be talking through the requirements. There's going to be a lot of finger pointing back and forth. Well, I think it's a network problem, right? It's always a network problem. So basically, you know, the finger pointing leads to where you're going to search first. And then that team is going to have to prove that, you know, uh, it's them or it's not them. And then it, just like the ticket, then it's going to work its way down the line. Each team's either going to have to, uh, you know, accept the responsibility or prove that it's not them so that it can go to the next. So it really just lengthens things out and creates a bit of animosity at times. Now, the flip side of that uh, would be an EUC team, where you'd actually construct a team. Um, the single team can do the full stack or nearly the full stack, uh, basically the majority of the things that we talked about ab above. Now, uh, HDI infrastructure makes this um, much simpler, right, because now you're um, collapsing the compute, the storage, and a bit of the network. Uh, into a single uh, to use platform such as Nutanix and then Prism makes it extremely easy to use. So um, it makes it realistic for uh, an EUC team to manage uh, a Nutanix clusters as part of it. And then, you know, certainly they own the EUC uh, piece of it. Um, they could or couldn't own the endpoints, right? It's, it's up to them, you know, on how much you, you collapse this. And how you build this team uh, is you know there's lots of ways to do it right so you could go out and hire new talent um, I like the idea of assembling the team from existing teams right so you could draft uh, people from those uh, you know siloed approach right get somebody from the compute storage that across uh, potentially network or at least the, the broker the endpoints the apps um, so you have a well-rounded team and then there's a lot of cross training, you know, comes on. So you cross pollinate all those skills, right? So the, the UC broker person that comes across is learning from the compute storage. Hey, this HCI is an example is super easy. So they're pretty quickly, they, they gain those skills. And then what you end up with is a well-rounded team that they can pretty much manage the, the whole stack from end to end. Um, so there's less of that uh, siloed approach where you're waiting uh, on the other person to do that. And then this, the thing I like about the UC team is they have a single focus. The team all works in unison, and they're focused on the best end user experience, which is what uh, you're looking to provide to your users. And if you don't provide that, that's when you're going to hear back. So uh, it's probably one of the biggest things, you know, uh, certainly cutting down the time to work, um, resolving issues faster and easier, and then the single focus of, of just having a great experience. Now, there's some middle ground. Right, so you could find a blended, maybe a halfway point between there, where you're reducing the number of layers. Um, still a good place to be, um, and then 
you can, you know, say you collapse the EUC and the infrastructure teams, you know, if you deploy uh, Horizon Citrix or Citrix on Nutanix as an example, and then your Citrix team also manages the uh, infrastructure piece using Nutanix and Prism, then you're collapsing uh, several layers there, right? And then they can then just consume uh, services like the network and maybe the endpoints from other teams. And that, you know, is reducing your stack and, and, and your time. So it's, uh, you know, still a pretty good win for you. So a little bit of review from part one of the series is what services you're providing just as a refresher, right? Typically, the main two UC services are, are VDI, you know, so you're providing a, a virtual desktop. Everybody's getting a full VM with a full OS installed in there in the applications. Um, or you're using some type of non-persistent where it's a shared image. But the main thing is everybody's got their own instance um, of a VM, typically in VDI, and, th and then they have all the, the resources of, of those uh, to access. You can do uh, RDSH based, so kind of like um, shared hosted desktops, if you think about that, where um, you take a single VM and you'll have a handful of users using that same OS, so it's kind of a middle ground. Or just application presentation, so uh, if you're using like RDSH servers and then you install applications on those and then you're just presenting out the app or applications installed on them, uh, is kind of the two main services. Part of that is keep that in mind uh, as we talk about the next things. So securing access, uh, pretty simple, but um, very important. So um, some of these things may seem like just super obvious, but I can't tell you how many times in my consulting uh, past that uh, these come up and seem as a challenge and a roadblock and geez, I'm just not sure how we would change that. So uh, this may, be, may seem simple, but uh, we're gonna you know, go through this because it's uh, very important, right? So. Um, a valid ID should be used to secure all access to desktops and applications. Does seem simple, right? This is typically Active Directory, but uh, you know some modern solutions may use um, you know SAML support. So you could use like something like Google Auth or Okta or something like that, um, which could still be backed by Active Directory, but it's just a you know a more universal way to um, to provide authentication. You want to get rid of shared accounts where possible, right? So uh, a single account used by multiple users for various reasons. So um, typically it's a shared endpoint and then it's more of a transient work environment. So um, I give the example of healthcare or manufacturing, right? So you might have a place on the manufacturing floor uh, or like a, you know, when you go to the doctor and you go in one of the exam rooms, right? Um, you don't typically see a nurse assigned to an exam room, right? They, the doctors and the nurses float between all them and they just log in when they come into the room. Well, in many of these cases uh, in the past, I've seen where those PCs are set up to where it auto logs in uh, the PC and it's using a, a shared nature. Or literally you see the username and password written on each of these terminals, uh, written on it or it might be on a post-it note. So literally it can just come in and they type it and they log in. That gets them into the PC um, uh, for that. Now they may have to then put their credentials to get into one of the business applications. So um, the business application is probably secured, you know, from myself as a patient, you know, logging in and trying to mess around. But if that, um, you know, shared PC is authenticated into Windows and it's on the network, there's some risk there, right? Because now that network can see whatever it has, or that PC can see whatever it has access to the network, and whether that's, uh, you know, what it can touch on the network is if that's going to ask uh, for credentials again. So there's uh, some exposure by that. So ideally, you want to remove uh, these shared logins, uh, if, if at all possible, or at least find a compromise. Um, so um, if they need shared access to the endpoint, um, ideally, you don't want them logging in and out. So, so maybe you can um, allow shared access into the thin device or into the OS. Um, but then, when they log into their application or VDI session, obviously that requires their uh, you know user credentials. And then to make that more secure, you would need to limit the access of that physical device. You know, what apps, what data can use. Ideally, this should be put on its own network. 
and that network should probably only have access to basically the uh, the connection servers as an example for the you know for the EUC broker um, as part of that right it shouldn't probably shouldn't even have internet access because it can get that through the uh, the remote session um, shouldn't have access to application servers etc right so just basically the bare minimum of what it can access for networks that way somebody can't install you know some kind of sniffer on it or some malware and use it to run around and infect other things or you know try to do some other uh, nefarious tasks and then you know secure right so uh, obviously you need to secure the access uh, access to the desktop and apps um, you could you know when people are remote and they want to connect in um, you know in a physical world typically you gave them a VPN client and they would use that to connect uh, with an EUC, it's not the best access. Certainly, you can do that. But um, certain brokering, you know, protocols from from um, EUC vendors can actually have poor performance when they're funneled through a VPN. So you can affect user experience, and it's also just a more clunkier uh, method, right? Because the user's got to connect to the VPN and sign in, and then they're going to have to then open the UC client. Uh, to connect to the broker to get their desktop or their applications right so you, you'd want you want to cut down the steps make it a better user experience but the clunky uh, part of it also is that typically when you connect to a VPN it, it gives you pretty wide network access uh, to the data center so you may connect and then get full access to your entire network in your organization uh, or they may have just it narrowed down a little bit but it's typically you get pretty wide access to the network so um, if you're doing this from untrusted devices or even devices that you know are corporate provided, um, if somebody gets VPN access and they have you know pretty wide access to your data center, and again can can do things um, to it that you'd like them to not do. So the other downside is you know the VPNs work. It's managed by the network team, so you're going to need to work with them to manage it to do updates. If you want policies created that limit access, like um, you can do like VPN profiles or policies that would limit which networks you could see in the data center. Those can be created, uh, but it's more complex. You're working with another team. If you require updates and you got to go back to them, that takes time. And then as you add users, you, you're going to have to add users and remove them from these policies. So it's just a much heavier lift. There's better ways to do this. Um, and the better way is using some kind of secure edge access method. Uh, and the great news is all the EUC and DAS providers offer a mechanism for this, right? So if you're using Horizon, um, you'd be familiar with the security server, uh, which, you know, is in, in Horizon's 8 is finally dying. But if you're on older versions, it's still around or the newer access gateway uh, model. And then the Citrix world, you're familiar with Citrix gateway, uh, the Citrix ADC or, you know, commonly known as the Netscaler in, in past times. And then Xiframe, this is just you know, built in as part of the service. So these secure access models are typically a, sec a secure device. So it could be a physical device or just a service, you know, that's installed inside a virtual machine. Uh, and then these sit at the edge of your network, right? So they're in a DMZ like zone. Uh, they would go through your security checks and get passed. And then what they're able to do is establish secure connections from outside the company to in to the inside UC services. So you're not opening that just kind of wide open VPN access to your data center. You're now allowing just the browser or the client to connect to just the desktop or the applications that the user is assigned to based upon uh, their privileges through the UC uh, solution. So now that remote laptop or desktop can't just look all over the data center. Um, they would need to connect into their session and then based upon the rules and the security of their session is controlled what they can see within your, your data center. So uh, a much simpler, more elegant solution that's uh, definitely more secure uh, and can be controlled you know, more easily uh, through that EUC team that we talked about earlier. So data uh, access and the endpoints. So if you're centralizing your data, or your, if you're centralizing things in general, should any data be on the endpoints? Well, I would say ideally no, but requirements uh, and the different types of business may drive that. So 
Um, if you think of if you have sales data, if there's personally identified data, identifiable data, if there's medical records, etc., right? Those sh typically should be a big no-no. They shouldn't be stored on a local endpoint. Um, seen many times where you see, you know, some company in the news and there was a data breach, um, you know, before um, a lot of healthcare. Um, you know, went to uh, application presentation or um, uh, VDI, it had data on endpoints as an example. And, and that was a big no-no because if somebody broke into a clinic and they stole uh, some PCs, uh, probably just because they want some PCs and sell them, then there was personal information, healthcare records on them. And that was a pretty big liability and would result in, you know, that organization in today's world getting fined and obviously getting a, a ton of bad press, right? So if you're centralizing in general, you don't want any uh, data on the endpoints. So that, that comes to mind in, um, well, then what access should you should you provide or, or allow them, you know, for removing data? So um, immediately comes to mind USB access. Should I provide any UX, USB access? You can certainly prevent all types of USB access. You could just turn it off so that if somebody puts a USB device um, in uh, their you know endpoint, whether it's a thin client, Chromebook, Windows, PC, Mac, whatever, it uh, would be recognizable by the local machine, but wouldn't, wouldn't be recognized by the uh, you know the remote session, so the virtual desktop, the application session, etc. There's a middle ground, you know, maybe you have a need uh, to use some devices such as cameras, microphones, signature pads, etc. Right, so there's devices that they may need to use their job. So you could uh, limit the access to just a subset of devices or storage devices. Typically, most roles don't need access to storage devices. So ideally, you'd probably like to, to, to block them to mass storage devices. You don't want them to be able to plug in, you know, a USB drive, you know, thumb drive, etc. cetera, um, because um, if they don't need to bring data in, you, and then you certainly don't want them uh, mounting those drives and copying a bunch of data out of your sessions also. And then the ability to mount drives, right? So if you're using uh, more of a full client, so if it's actual Windows PC or a Mac, the ability to mount your local drive into your session for that. Do they have the uh, requirement that they need to do that? Sometimes there is, generally not, right? If they're not doing work on their endpoint, then there's probably little need for them to mount that uh, so that they can move documents back and forth. So um, if they don't have the need, then you don't want to pr uh, present it because you don't want to take the risk that they're copying a bunch of data out of the out of the company onto their local device, which then you know that now they've got local copies again, and local copies open you up to risk and obviously the theft piece, and then the copy and paste. You know, should they be allowed to to copy and paste? Uh, you know, into or out of their virtual session. Um, and again, requirements are going to drive all these based upon, you know, what the type of job. A lot of them, times they don't require this. Basically, it comes down to, you know, are they doing work, uh, you know, outside of their session? And if so, this may be beneficial. But again, let the requirements, you know, drive what, what you do. And then you control these with policies. And, um, you know, not to, you know, be it. To, you know to a pulp but the requirements are going to drive this and you'll need to be a bit flexible because not every use case not every group of users is the same so you, you may be like 90 percent of your users you don't allow them but then there's a subset of users uh, that their requirements need this so you need the flexibility in how you design the policies and the groups of users to, to provide the flexibility that you can control these uh, you know between the different types of users and then you can control a lot of these options right inside the EUC solution. Um, but, you know, if you have more stringent requirements or the EUC solution doesn't provide this, then you may need additional security software, maybe something like a, a DLP piece of software, which is, you know, digital loss protection that, you know, prevent, you know, data leakage, you know, from them copying it out. Um, if whatever is provided in the, the brokering solution isn't applicable to meet your requirements, then, then you have to go to a, a third-party vendor to, to secure that up. And just an example, um, you know, certainly Citrix and Horizon, very similar capabilities. Um, how you control these in there is typically through a policy. 
or through a group policy um, that uh, would have been added to group policy by the broker and then you control that and um, you would make you know different OUs in, in Active Directory that would re relate to your use cases or groups of users and control the policy there. I'm showing an example here with, with Zyframe uh, in basically the different launch pads which the launch pads are kind of like groups of users or pools of users if you think of that and then I'm looking uh, you know at these session settings for one of these groups of users and you can see you know clipboard integration It's just a toggle switch. I can turn it on and off and then I can control whether it's bi-directional or just goes one direction If I want to allow uh, Allow users to upload or download things from the session again. You can just you toggle those as, as simple ways um, to control that as an example Next up monitoring um, so monitoring is pretty important Historically, there wasn't a, there wasn't much monitoring done in the physical PC world. Um, you didn't invest in fancy monitoring tools to monitor all those PCs and laptops that were out uh, all over your organization, because everyone you know pretty much operated on isolated islands of compute. So everybody had their own PC. Most of those PCs generally had an excess of performance for what they were doing. You know, there was a few power users that maybe needed all the performance they could get. But you know, if you buy a modern, even a low-end PC today and run Windows on it, um, and the person is just like a productivity type worker running an office, maybe a couple of business applications, they generally have uh, way excess amount of compute capacity that they would need. So um, infrastructure was generally um, not an issue. It, it would have physical failures, like a drive could go bad, a motherboard, you know, power supply, etc. Right, where something would take the PC or laptop down, but you generally didn't have performance complaints about the local PC. Now, most of the complaints, uh, if it was performance or user experience related, maybe uh, probably relied on something that was centrally provided, so like an application, the login portion. They were accessing file shares, etc., etc. Right, so something that was centrally provided um, could provide them, you know, with an issue that they would complain about. You know, maybe the file server was uh, short; it took them three times longer to log in today than normal. Uh, those, so typically you weren't doing a lot of monitoring there because if they complained about a file share performance and somebody would go look at the, the NAS as an example or the Windows server that was providing it, troubleshoot that, and then you fixed it for everyone that, com that complained. Now the exception to this is uh, with you know our world needing more security, um, that we probably I'll see a lot of organizations that are deploying security tools to monitor what's going on on these PCs. So there's probably a lot more security monitoring going on than in the past, which would be an example of what you might be monitoring uh, in a disaggregated example. But when you move to EUC or DAS, it's going to flip it on the head because now everything's centrally located, probably runs on centralized infrastructure. And now that centralized infrastructure has you know a bunch of users running on it. So now if you, you know, have a memory issue on a server, there might be 20 to 100 users running on that one server that could be, uh, you know, briefly affected or affected, you know, for a period of an hour or hours, depending on what's going on. So, um, you know, infrastructure is important. You want to monitor it. And now sessions are now sized for the resources required. You don't just run out and buy the latest or whatever the cheapest PC model is and because that... PC or the latest one and you know had a abundance of performance like I mentioned earlier <clears throat> you're now sizing based upon the requirements you remember in part one of this series we talked about you know how do you gather requirements and then get the data to size users you monitor and track their sessions and learn what they're using so if I typically use uh, say 800 megahertz and then I burst to a thousand. I'm going to expect that my session is sized, you know, from around. I'm going to get a thousand megahertz or maybe 1,200 megahertz assigned to me, and and that's all the resources I'm going to get because that's all that I'm going to, you know, be assigned. But if I get assigned a new job role and I'm now now doing something more and I need more resources, but uh, I didn't get a different sized, uh, say, you know, virtual desktop as an example. Uh, then I'm going to not have enough resources. I'm going to have a performance issue, right? So being sized based upon what's required versus just, you know, whatever the latest is, is, is different. So you need to monitor that. You need to understand that. You need to know what is consumed. 
and you, you should know this at the user level probably the host level and definitely the cluster layer so you can understand you know how all these things jives and you're you're mo watching CPU usage memory usage network login times and by login times uh, it is helpful to know oh it takes 30 seconds on average and take today it took a minute and a half but if you really want to troubleshoot that you need a breakdown of the login times so you need to know like all the steps in the login process how long each one took and then you can see like okay the login is much longer today but which of those steps is much login which is much longer so you know if if it takes you know today it's taking four times longer to apply the group policies than normal uh, then I can look, to see, is there an AD problem or did somebody create uh, some new group policy uh, that shouldn't have been put in the VDI environment that's really slowing things down, as an example. Um, so understanding all these different, different resources, and there's certainly many more you'd want to monitor and understand. Infrastructure tools are great, but they're only going to provide you a basic high level view, right? You can kind of see what's going on at the host and cluster level, cluster level and the virtual machine, but you get no... Uh, you're generally going to get no visibility inside the virtual machine. So you're not going to understand what's going on inside the user session, what's going on with their apps uh, and all that. And then if certainly if it's a RDSH environment, uh, you're going to see what's going on in the VM, but not what each individual user is using. So if there's 20 or 30 users in there, you don't know if they're using things equally or if one is you know hogging the resources. So generally you like a combination of the infrastructure tool, that either comes from your infrastructure provider, uh, such as Nutanix with Prism, uh, or the EUC broker, you know, may offer, you know, some basic, you know, like the hypervisor uh, broker offers some uh, infrastructure monitoring. Uh, EUC tools are the best for this because they give you all that session and user data um, for that. They are an extra cost, generally not super expensive, but often overlooked, um, and people try to deal without it. But if you really want to do a great job, uh, you should have an EUC monitoring tool. And some of the big ones there's out there from Uber Agent, Control Up, Liquidware, Lakeside, etc. And some of these uh, were mentioned in the first part because they also make the assessment software. Now securing uh, desktops in the, in the traditional approach relied on physical networking. So you could use uh, perimeter firewalls to make rules and again you're relying on the network team this is pretty clumsy and you're always having to go there uh, for ads, changes, deletes, and uh, makes it very clumsy and time consuming. You could create different VLANs for your different groups of users as shown here. You know, I put all the HR desktops on one VLAN and the sales on another, and this gives you some form of segmentation. And then you could prevent the routing of traffic between the VLANs. So I could not allow the HR desktops to talk to the sales desktops, if that's an example. But I really can't control, uh, you know, stopping the HR desktops from talking to each other. I mean, you could do something crazy like private VLANs, which is even more clunky and, and, and hard to manage. Um, but generally, you're not going to stop that inter um, v VM or inter PC, uh, you know, talking to each other. So it's an option in the physical world. Um, you know, if you have zero budget. You could certainly look into a few of these, and it's something better than just having everybody on you know big flat networks. But a more modern approach to this would be to use some type of um, you know virtual firewall. And certainly in the virtual world, then I can use these policies to secure users or virtual machines. An example: so Nutanix has um, Nutanix Flow, and it works uh, on our HV hypervisor. So any desktops or applications deployed on HV, such as when you run Citrix on HV, or if uh, Xyframe is controlling on-prem HV clusters, then you could use Flow to secure your, your desktops uh, as an example. Um, and it can secure the desktops. Basically, you apply the desktops using um, policies to control the virtual machines, or you can do it based upon user identity. So when a user logs into the virtual machine, it looks up their AD membership and then finds the policy applies to them and adjusts the uh, firewall rules based upon the user that's logged in there. So now I can control these desks, uh, or the, sorry, these pools of desktops uh, based upon the policies that we create to them. So similar approach, but these all could, could still be on separate VLANs. It could be on the same VLAN depending on the size, but now I can apply these virtual overlays to control uh, what they can talk to. So I can finally grain 
control uh, what networks are allowed to uh, access these uh, services and then what they're allowed to talk you know going out of the session so as an example the HR pool on the top we can bless it to talk to the HR app but not any other applications as an ex you know as an example and same with the sales and then the top three ones you can see there's the you know the the circle with the with the line through with the red one preventing those uh, VMs from talking to each other so in those three pools of desktops we're not going to allow those virtual desktops to talk to each other but the bottom one the engineering one they've got a requirement from that so by you know simply checking a, a box in the policy I can enable them to talk to each other so right in prism I can um, create these simple you know security policies that can you know very finely control what networks uh, what ports, etc., can talk in and out of these um, desktops and applications for, for easy control. And then, you know, there are certainly other examples of, um, you know, solutions. So VMware makes uh, NSX. So if you're using uh, vSphere as a hypervisor, whether you're running Citrix on vSphere or Horizon on vSphere, um, then you could, you know, look at NSX as a similar approach uh, to do the same thing. Um, generally just a heavier lift with the uh, design, deploy, and, and management of that, and, and often a different team flow is re integrated right into PRISM and, and really works for that collapsing of, of the responsibilities, the, you know, those silos into uh, an EUC team that we spoke about earlier. And that wraps up part two. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining, and uh, remember you to uh, tune in to part three of the Masterclass series. Thanks. Awesome presentation, Brian. Really appreciate that. So much wisdom and insight on remote workforce solutions here. Uh, I want to thank everyone for the good questions that have come in. We'll be doing our best to get back to those uh, re via email remotely. Uh, we want to keep this event as short as possible. And I want to remind everyone to stay tuned and watch your email for the upcoming and final um, event in this masterclass series, which is on September 1st, Freedom of Choice Application Catalogs Empower Users to Self-Service uh, on uh, at 3 o'clock, again, on September 1st. Hope to see you there. And then finally, our Visa $300 gift card winner on today's event is Casey Wood from Oregon. Congratulations, Casey Wood from Oregon. We'll reach out to you to deliver your gift card. I hope to see everyone on a future event. I hope you stay safe, take care, and have a great day. Bye-bye.